All right, let's go ahead and start. So we're going to start off uh, doing, finishing up 16, starting 17, and then we'll review the test material. You can't open up the PowerPoint? Okay, I will repost those then. Really? I'll, I mean, I'll, I'll try to repost it, see if that helps any, maybe. Okay. Okay, so let's finish up here. So we started off, we, um, we did this over the lab looking at aromatic, anti-aromatic, and non-aromatic. So let's do some examples. No, this is not on the test. It's the, the exam is 10, 11, and 14. Okay, so let's look at these. Let's look at this first one. Would you label this as aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic? Non-aromatic? Why would you do non? Yeah, this top carbon, there's nothing. It's sp3 hybridized. Nothing on it. So this one would be non-aromatic. What about this one? Aromatic, you can see all the carbons have some sort of sp2 carbon on them with a positive and negative, a lone pair or a double bond. Uh, it's not between 8 and 13 carbons. And then if we do the 4 and plus 2, what is that equal to? Well, not total, not n, but yeah, 6. So it's 2, 4, 6. So it's 2 for each double bond. So it's 6, so n equals to 1, so we got aromatic. What about this one here? Anti-aromatic. So you see every carbon is sp2. And if we do 4n plus 2, what is it equal to here? 4. When we do the positive, um, what does that count as our total? 0. So we have a total of four electrons there, n equals to one half. So this would be what? Anti-aromatic. Now see if you can figure this one out. How can you make this aromatic? Okay, so you know, putting a positive on there, or a negative, a radical, how can you put, how can you make this aromatic. What is it right now? Not anti. It's non-aromatic right now. Which carbon is the problem? This top one right here. So let's try uh, putting a positive on it. Yeah, that's what I have above. and That would make it what? Anti-aromatic. So let's try like a lone pair. Would that work? Yes, because if we do 4n plus 2, uh, 2, 4, 
6 and equals to 1, which would be aromatic. Does everybody follow that? Okay, and then we can do one with like nitrogens in it. Uh, let me look at this one. What would you label this one as? Aromatic. So let's look. Um, so every carbon or nitrogen in this case has something, a lone pair or a double bond or positive charge. This carbon, is it connected to a double bond? This one? Yes, does this nitrogen have either a lone pair or a double bond? Uh, this carbon? Nitrogen? And this carbon? Yes, so everything's fine. Um, it's not between 8 and 13. So when we count this, we do 4n plus 2. What would that equal? 6 here. So we need to decide, the big thing is, do you count those lone pairs or not? And how do you decide if you do? Yeah, if it has a double bond coming off of it, do not count them. Okay? So let's say this was a single bond. Of course, that will mess up that carbon, but just pretend it didn't. Okay? If that was a single bond there, then we would have to count those lone pairs. Okay? But do you see this nitrogen has a double bond coming off of it? So don't count them. This one has a double bond, so do not count them. So we have a total of two, four, six. So then N equals to 1, which would be aromatic. Now really the last thing on this chapter is deciding, uh, usually we're looking at nitrogens, if they're going to be basic or not. Uh, looking here, um, now when we decided if this was aromatic, did we have to count the lone pairs? No. If you do not have to count the lone pairs, that means the lone pairs could, you know, bond to like a hydrogen. Okay, they're available to bond, okay, because you do not need them to be aromatic. So they would be considered basic. So these are two basic nitrogens. So let's look at another example, and we'll see if it's aromatic or not, and then also decide if the nitrogens are basic or not. Okay, so first look, does every nitrogen or carbon have a lone pair or a double bond or something? Yes. And it's not between 8 and 13, so it's not going to be non-aromatic. So it's either anti-aromatic or aromatic. So then we count 4n plus 2 equals to what? So we have that, um, let's look at this nitrogen here. Do we count this lone pair? No, because there's a double bond. What about this lone pair? Yes, because there's no double bond directly off that nitrogen. So I'm going to circle it because I'm going to count it. So how many total electrons, pi electrons, do you count here? Six. Two, four, six. So again, n equals to one. This is aromatic. Now we, let's look at the nitrogens. 
Would this one be basic? Yes. Why? You didn't need to count those electrons to be aromatic, so they're available to bond. Did I need to count these? Yes. That means they're not available to bond because when I do resonance, I can move this over, I should move that over to there, anyway, so forth. These need to be available to resonate, meaning they're not available to bond. So this one would not be basic. So how many basic nitrogens? One basic nitrogen. And let's do one more to have an example of. Oh, wait, I put too many. Let me get this. Okay, does each nitrogen or carbon have a double bond, lone pair, or positive? Yes. How do we count these? Do, uh, we're counting the total. Are we counting this is a one giant ring or kind of like two individual rings? We're counting eight through 13. Two rings. So is there any, this ring or this ring, is it between eight and 13 carbons? Okay. So we're not non-aromatic. So now let's count the total uh, pi electrons. So first of all, do I count this lone pair? No. Huh? No. This one? This one? Yes. This one? No. So let's see. We have 2, 4, 6, 8, 10. So 4n plus 2 equals to 10. It would be 8. n equals to 2. This would be aromatic. Now, how many basic nitrogens do we have? Three basic. Any of them that you circle that you need to count, that will be your non-basic. So there are three. If they have a double bond coming off of them, they're going to be basic. And one non-basic. So I could ask, I mean, I know it's not on this exam, but I could ask it either way. I could ask how many basic nitrogens, or I could ask how many non-basic hydrogens. So just make sure you, whatever the question is, you read it correctly. Because I don't want you to put, if I ask how many non-basic, I don't want you to put three because you read it as basic. Okay, so we went through this, this here. So we went through all of those. Thing. Okay, let's do this one really quick. Aromatic, anti-aromatic, or non-aromatic. And then we'll say how many uh, basic hydrogens. Two basic, how do you know? The, the two double bonds, and then when we count the total electrons, so two, four, do we count this one? Yes, six, so N would be one, so that would be aromatic. 
Remember these, when you count these, and we already went over this before, but these are like two uh, separate rings whenever you're count, you know, when you're trying to decide if it's carbon 8 through 13, because those aren't flat like you need them to be. So this is like a six-member carbon ring and a six-member carbon ring. It's not like a 12-member carbon ring or whatever when they're fused like that. Uh, same here. Do you see this is like three different rings there? Yeah. Like this here? This, this carbon, yeah, for both sides of the ring. Yeah, so that double bond counts for this ring, and it counts for this ring. Because they're, you see they're sharing those carbons also. So you share like that double bond. So when you're doing these, if you're trying to decide if these are aromatic or not, really all you need to do is just count these double bonds. So 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14 and then calculate it from there. Uh, so you don't worry about the common names. But one thing you will want to know, and this will come up in the next chapter, is uh, the branches. So this is benzene. Uh, we can draw the circle, meaning just alternating double bonds. We're just lazy when we draw the circle, OK? But I mean, by all means, draw the circle. I don't care if you're lazy. But just know when I'm lazy, that's what it means. OK, so do you see, if we're comparing x to y, let's say x was considered a carbon 1, what would y be? 2. So the, the relationship here is 1, 2. We call that ortho. OK? If you have branches that are two apart, that relationship is called ortho. Now, what is it here? 1 and 3, and we call that meta. And then do you see here 1, and you count 1, 2, 3, 4, and that is para. So when you're looking at these, for example, this is benzene, and do you see the two chloro groups? So dichloro, and do you see right here they put an O in front of it? That's because they're one, two apart, meaning ortho. Then if you look at this one, these are three apart, right? One and three, so they have the M for meta. And then when they're opposite, they're P for para. So just know 1, 2, ortho, 1, 3, meta, 1, 4, para. And do you see underneath here, you have uh, like the black name and then the blue name? Either one of those is acceptable. So um, I know you haven't gone and started chapter 17 or 16 homework yet, which is fine. Uh, but just when you do these, just know it could be either one. Okay, you could put the O there, or you could say one, two, which means the same thing. Okay, so one, two, ortho, one, three, meta, one, four, para. You cannot use, for example, ortho, meta, para in a situation like this. So let's say NO2 is my number one position. Okay? Actually, that's, I don't like this one. Let's do this one that's more dramatic. Okay, NO2 is my number one position again. How far is this branch right here? Yeah, it's ortho, right? It'd be one, two. But how far is this one? Meta, it's one, three. So how do you name ortho, meta, nitro? I mean, you can't do that. So at that point, when you have three branches like that, you have to do the numbering system. You have to say, you know, two, four, whatever. The only time you can use ortho meta para is back over here when you only have two branches. So it's only relationship between two branches, never more than that. Huh? Because they actually compare, see phenol is the parent name. 
So they actually said OH was number one. It's, it doesn't actually matter. I know it sounds weird. But whichever one's your parent one, in this case, phenol, which means your alcohol is number one. So this would be one, two, one, four. And you don't usually, um, I know here they did, but you don't usually uh, label your number one branch because you just assume it is number one. And over here, let's see, the parent name is benzoic acid. So which one do you think is number one? Yeah, it's the carboxylic acid, which is this one right here. So then these are one, two, three, four, five. So. This here. No, it's not this one. T is. This, if it had a methyl branch right there, would be T and T. Right? What is T and T? If you've seen any of the Warner Brother cartoons, I hope you would know. Dynamite. Yeah. So that's trinitrotoluene. Toluene meaning a methyl branch. Coming out. Anyway, just so you know. And that's it for this chapter. So I want to introduce the next one. <laughs> I know. <laughs> but for this one, for chapter 16, really, it's not too bad. You just need to know aromatic, anti-aromatic, non-aromatic, uh, if a nitrogen is basic or not, and then just know the ortho para. So those three concepts are all there is, really, for chapter 16. No reactions. But then, yeah, then chapter 17 has a lot. But one thing that is nice about 17, there might be quite a few reactions, but they're all uh, pretty straightforward to predict. And the mechanisms are very similar. So with this, we're going to look at, and I'm only going to introduce two um, reactions today, and that's it. Two new ones, and we'll, we'll go to the review. So we're going to look at reactions, really, of benzene. Uh, I don't like this picture here. So let's go to this one. All of the mechanisms, there's benzene mechanisms, and they all look like this. So you're going to have a one of the double bonds off benzene. Where a double bond can attack something, can be a nucleophile. So it's going to make a bond to some electrophile. This is a double bond. So your electrophile will add to one of the sides of the double bond, leaving the other one with a positive charge. And then you, a base will come in, take off the hydrogen to reform benzene. Benzene is very stable, so it always wants to reform itself. So do you see overall you have benzene, and then at the end, you have benzene with this E on there. Okay, so it's all you're doing. Don't worry, we'll do this a million times in this chapter. But this is the basic uh, mechanism for the whole entire chapter. Okay, so I don't remember if you remember from last chapter, but if we just put, for example, Br2 in with benzene, nothing will happen. It's not reactive enough. Benzene's too stable. Okay? But if we put Br2 with iron through bromide in there as a catalyst, let's see what happens. I add a bromine. Okay? And do you see at the end, I still reform benzene. I don't add two bromines. Okay? I'll add one bromine and reform benzene. And that'll happen every single time. So you're only adding one branch to benzene in every one of your reactions. Never two unless you start off with one. But you're only adding one at a time. Okay? But can you see from here, what do I have a lot of in this reaction? Bromines, right? So if you had never seen this reaction before, what would you have probably, hopefully, predicted you added somewhere? Bromine. Okay? And that's what a lot of these reactions are. Um, even though you've never seen them, you might be able to at least come close to what to predict what to put on benzene. So let's kind of look at this mechanism. It, it's pretty simple, hopefully. 
And so all we're going to look at today is how do we add bromine and how do we add chlorine. And that's it. So overall, we will have benzene. So every reaction, the basic reaction in this chapter, will start with benzene. And in this case, we're going to put Br2FeBr3 over the arrow. And then what did we say that put on benzene? Bromine and how many? One. You with a circle. Either way to draw it is fine. Anywhere you want. There's nothing on there to direct it. And don't worry about what directing means at this point. We'll learn. But there's nothing on there to influence it. So let's say half the class puts it here. A fourth of it puts it there, and another fourth puts it there. It doesn't matter. You put anywhere uh, you want to put it at this point. Because think of it as like a circle. There's no really any start or beginning or end or whatever. So anywhere is fine. So if we look at the mechanism here, so bromine cannot react without this catalyst. So the first thing you're going to have for every one of these reactions is to make your electrophile. Electrophile meaning what benzene wants to attack. So the first part of the mechanism is make, and I'm going to put E plus for electrophile. And how you make your electrophile is always what is on the arrow. So in this case I have Br2, and I'm going to write it like this for the mechanism. And I have and this I could just write FeBr3. Now bromine is attracted to iron. You can already see that it's already attracted three bromines to itself. So the first part of this mechanism is one of your bromines, it doesn't matter which one you choose, I'm just going to choose the closest one, is going to use one of its lone pairs to make a bond to the iron. Your metals, iron's a metal, right? Always has some sort of partial positive. So bromine's electronegative is attracted to this partial positive iron, which gives you this. Do you see in doing this, bromine basically lost electrons because it's sharing them now. Okay? So this is now a positive charge. And you could do the formal charge if you want. One, two, three, four, five, six, and it should have seven. Iron, do you see that it gained electrons? And so now it actually has a negative charge. Now this is your good electrophile, believe it or not. You have made it. So the last part of the mechanism, which every, uh, we'll say 95% of the mechanisms in this chapter have this part right here. So we're going to call this the benzene uh, reaction, I guess. Because we haven't actually put anything on benzene yet. We just made a good electrophile. And this, this part, is just, it's easy enough to just draw an arrow. Okay, so we have benzene. And let me go ahead and draw my good electrophile down here. Okay, now what's going to happen, the best way to explain this, let me show you and then explain it. I think it will be easier. So uh, benzene wants to make a bond with something. And what it, because, you know, the bond, the double bonds are made of electrons. This is a really good electrophile, meaning it wants to be attacked. So 
So the double bond on benzene is actually going to make a bond right there to that bromine, causing this bond to break to go onto that bromine as a lone pair. Okay, so this leaves as FeBr4 minus. Oops, not. That's a single one. And then what did I just put on bromine? I mean, <laughs> benzene? Bromine. And it could be on either position, the top position or the bottom position, just one of the positions of the double bond. So one side of the double bond is a bromine, and what charge is here? Positive charge. Because it no longer has those electrons from the double bond. Okay, so, or I'll give you a second to draw that before I... So I get the question sometimes, why did the benzene attack this bromine and not this bromine with a positive charge? Okay, because this has a full positive charge, so you would think it's attracted there. The reason is, is because this bond is basically already breaking. Okay? Bromine, is that electronegative? Yes, it's very electronegative. It does not want a positive charge on itself. So this bromine, this bond between bromine and bromine is already basically gone. Okay? And so it's already getting those lone pairs and leaving. And so this bromine here is actually more of the one with the positive charge, meaning it's actually more reactive than that one, because this one is already leaving, leaving this one by itself with two electrons short. Kind of think of it as a water as a leaving group. Let me put it over here. It has a positive charge, but if we have, let's say, like chlorine coming in, Chlorine never makes a bond to the oxygen. It always makes a bond to the carbon. Again, because oxygen's electronegative, so it's already trying to leave with those electrons, leaving carbon actually with a positive charge. Okay? So anytime you see an electronegative atom with a positive charge, think of that bond as already broken, and whatever it's attached to is actually the positive charge. Okay, so that would be this bromine right here. So our final answer, we have it up there. Is this. Are we there yet? No, we need to make this double bond right here. So this is like an elimination, which means form a double bond. Now, do you remember, did we ever take a hydrogen off the positive, or do we take one one away? One away. Don't ever take anything off a positive, because if you take a hydrogen off a positive, then it actually makes it more positive. So you're going to take a hydrogen off where you added your branch. Now, do you see that this iron is negatively charged? So it's going to act as a base, pull off that hydrogen, and where is hydrogen going to leave this bond? Yeah, it'll end up forming HBr, but where will this bond go? To make this double bond. So it'll leave its electrons right here to form the double bond there. So this actually reforms FeBr3 plus HBr, if you want to know. So the benzene reaction will always, like the mechanism part, will always be like this. Benzene will attack your electrophile, and then a base will come, pull up a hydrogen to reform benzene. Okay, those are always the steps that occur. So this, this whole thing is the mechanism. This part up here where we make the electrophile and the benzene reaction. So if I had, let's say, this reaction drawn and I said to draw the mechanism, you would need both parts to get full credit.
Now let's, so that's one reaction. So let's look at the next reaction today and apply what we just learned here to the next reaction. So you can see that they're pretty much the same thing. So if I had a benzene, and we had this over the arrow, what do you think we're going to add on to benzene? Chlorine. Okay, now let's look at the mechanism. What am I going to use to form my good electrophile? Chlorine and the aluminum chloride below it. So Cl, Cl plus AlCl3. What do you think happens here? Same thing. So chlorine will make a bond to aluminum. Okay, so do you think we're done there? Well, not completely, but have we formed our good electrophile? Yes, so let's go to the benzene reaction. Draw benzene plus our electrophile. Overall, we're trying to get to this. Okay, what will benzene make a bond to? Chlorine, and which one? The left one. So benzene makes a bond right there, and then what? Yeah, the bond breaks going to the chlorine. So what left? Yeah, ALCL4 is a negative charge. Then we'll have our benzene. And what is the charge down here on benzene? Positive charge. All right, what is our next step? You guys going to take alpha hydrogen. Wh where is the hydrogen going to be taken off? Where the chlorine is. So this AlCl4 grabs hydrogen, and then hydrogen leaves its bond where? To make the double bond right here to form that. So do you see that it's exactly the same thing, except really with chlorine? And so a lot of your mechanisms are pretty similar to that. The only part that might change a little bit is how you make your electrophile. I chose these reactions in particular since they're the same. Uh, but besides that, your benzene reaction down here is exactly the same throughout the whole entire chapter. Okay, so that's what makes it nice. You learn it once, and you could apply it to all of them. And um, that's it. So here... Either you're going to put a, a chlorine or bromine on there, and that's all we know so far. So let's take a break. Thanks. <laughs> and then we'll review 10, 11, 14.
All right, let's do our review. Okay, so let's start with chapter 10. All right, let's start by naming this. And then also tell me what degree alcohol is, is a primary, secondary, tertiary. It is a secondary. Okay, so we have a secondary. And we can tell this, we look at, we find that alcohol, and we look at the carbon it's connected to. And this carbon is connected to how many carbons? Two, so it would be a secondary. What is the longest continuous chain here? Four. What would we call that? Butanol with the alcohol. Where is the alcohol located? Carbon two. And what else is on there? Chloro, which you said was where? Three. Does an alcohol have hydrogen bonding? Yes, right here. And so would that mean a higher or lower boiling point? Higher. Okay, and then pretty much the rest of this is just reactions here. So let's review these. Uh, starting with this one. <laughs> so right here, if I had a double bond and I reacted it with mercury, then you see water, NaBH4. What does that put on that compound? OH. Makarnikov or anti-Makarnikov? Makarnikov, which means it'll go to the center or the end? The center. So you see OH on that center carbon. Don't worry so much about the wedges and dashes for this one. So here, if I have BH3 peroxide and either water or hydroxide, what would that put on the double bond? OH, Makarnikov or anti? Anti, so the OH will go to the end or the center? The end, so you see the OH is at the end. <laughs> Do you remember? This should be online if you don't want to print it out. I mean, if you don't want to write it out is what I meant. <laughs> Does anybody have it so I know that it is online? It is online. Okay, so you don't have to sit there and write all these out. Huh? Week three. So if you just want to see they're numbered, like, don't worry about one and two. So only look at the ones we're going over. So you might put on, like, a note to yourself, one and two, ignore. And then three and four, you can put whatever note you want to put on there instead of writing out the whole thing. Anyway, so... Under diols, reaction one, what will this put on there? Two alcohols. And will those be sin or anti? Sin. You can see here there's a lot of oxygen. So it's going to add two OHs. What does MCPBA do? Add the epoxide, yeah, the triangle. And then if I react that with water... What do I get? 
to the IL sin or anti? Anti. So you see I have that written on here. So those are part of the old reactions from chapter 8 that you'll have to remember. Just those four there. Okay, then we learn new reactions. So let's look at, what if I have this? What type of reaction is this? Grignard. So what will this do to the carbonyl oxygen? Yeah, turn into the OH. And then what else are we adding on there? Carbon group. Uh, and how many carbons? Three in this case. Because you can see coming off here, I have one, two, three carbons. So my carbonyl oxygen turns to alcohol. Then I'm going to add one, two, three carbons. So if we look at the mechanism on here, what is the charge of that carbon? Negative. And where does it want to make a bond? Yeah, the partial positive carbon, which is that carbonyl carbon there. And what does it do to the double bond? Yeah, it pushes that up there. Three carbons. So then what is the final step here? Yes, negative will do what? Grab the hydrogen to make our final product. And what if I have this reaction? So what does it turn that carbonyl oxygen into? OH and alcohol. And what group does it on, on there in addition? What does NaBH4 add? Hydrogen, yeah, the hydride. And what type of alcohol is this? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Primary. So it's connected right here. How many carbons connected directly? Just one, because those are hydrogens. So let's look at the mechanism on this one. So this is a hydride here. You cross that out and just put the hydride. Where does it make a bond? Yeah, the carbonyl carbon, which causes the double bond to do what? Go up. And what's my final step? Yeah, gra oxygen grabs the hydrogen. We could also have this.
So what um, what happens to the carbonyl oxygen? Turns into an OH. And what are we adding to that carbonyl carbon? Carbon group, how many? Two. So what's my leaving group on here? Chlorine. So chlorine leaving group. So I'm adding one, two, three. Three carbons. One, two, three. One, two, three. And you, you'll always recognize this one because you'll have a two there. So let's look at the mechanism. Again, this is a Grignard, so what's the charge right there? Negative. Where does it make a bond? Carbonyl carbon, which causes those electrons for the double bond to go up. Now, is there a leaving group I can kick off at this point to reform? Yeah, chlorine. So chlorine will leave, reforming the carbonyl. Now, let's see, let's compare this to that. We've added, you see this one carbon group here, but how many total do we need to add? Two, so I need to add another one to make that the alcohol. So I'm going to basically just do this reaction again. So I have another Grignard, and again, where does that want to react? Carbonyl carbon again. Allowing those electrons to go up. Now, do I have any good leaving group at this point to reform the carbonyl? No. So, what's my final step? Grab this hydrogen to form our final product. that one. And then the last reaction of this chapter, or actually let's, let's kind of do two here. So if I want this to occur, what do I need to put over the arrow? NaBH4 would actually have a no reaction because it's not strong enough. So do you remember what the stronger one is? Lithium aluminum hydride. Sodium boryl hydride, the NaBH4, is a reducing agent, but it's weak. So it'll only reduce aldehydes and ketones, nothing else. So I guess when in doubt, you could put lithium aluminum hydride um, because that reduces everything. Ketones, aldehyde, uh, acid chlorides, whatever. And that is their last reaction for chapter 10. So no, for all of these reactions we're going to go over, be able to predict the product, which would be, if I gave you this and this, what would you draw as the product? Synthesis, which would be kind of what we just did there. What would you put over the arrow? And then the mechanism, which is all the arrows and everything. Okay? And then there's multiple choice. So multiple choice, I could ask you, I don't know. I could have this, or I could have this here. 
And then I could say, is that going to create a primary, secondary, tertiary, or quaternary alcohol? Okay. So if you drew this product, if you know how to draw the product, if you can predict the product, what type of alcohol is that? Primary. If it helps, all of your acid chlorides or esters will make a primary alcohol with this reaction, no matter what. But, yeah, something like that. Or I could just simply ask you this and list like four reagents and you have to pick which one is the correct one. So of course on something like this I would have lithium aluminum hydride and sodium borohydride. It would really be down to those two there and picking which one it was. So I could give you, you know, the choices of the reagent or the arrow. So that, that's the kind of thing you could ask for multiple choice. So if you can, so I wouldn't really focus so much on that because you have no idea what I'm going to ask, okay? But I can tell you this, if you can predict the product, do the synthesis, which is the arrow part, or draw the mechanism, then you'll be fine on the multiple choice, okay? So just um, focus on the workout portion and the multiple choice will come, okay? So that's all for chapter 10. Any questions? Okay, so let's move on to 11. I did have requests for sampling help, and we'll do that when we get to 14 because it's over 14. And then also for 14, I just gave you an extra day to do it. You can thank the Aggies for that. So. Could they what? <laughs> Okay, so chapter 11. Okay, the first reaction here. What I would do when I study, when I would study, is personally what I like to do. Obviously, you do whatever you want. But I like to make my own sort of study sheets. So for chapter 10, I'd probably have like a sheet that lists out all the reactions like on one page, and then on the back page have the mechanisms there. So I pretty much have everything I need on one sheet of paper. And then I would do the same thing for chapter 11 and then chapter 14. So literally, you could have three sheets of paper that have all your information, so then you don't have to go through all your notes and all of that. It's summarized right there. That also helps whenever you go to study for the final. You know, instead of having to go through everything, you have everything summarized in like three sheets of paper, or, or whatever it ends up being. Anyway, that's how I would usually study. All right, 11. Wait, did one, two, three, one, two. Let me change out the battery because I think it's about to die. But uh, figure out what you go over the arrow, what would go over there for each of those.
Okay, what would you put on this? PCC. Because how many times do we want to oxidize this one? One time here. Yeah. So PCC. And then how do we go to here? Yeah, Na2Cr2O7. Because how many times do we oxidize this one? Twice. So anytime you want to oxidize two times, always use this one. Anytime you want to oxidize one time, use the top one. Now, if I, this is a what type of alcohol? Primary, secondary, tertiary? Primary. Primary alcohols are the only time you actually have to worry about this. Because if I had a secondary... like this, and I'm trying to make that. Now how many times is that oxidized? One time. So does it actually, and it can only be oxidized how many times? One time. So does it actually matter which one I use? No, because even with a strong one, it's still only going to be oxidized one time. So only with a primary alcohol do you actually have to worry about the difference there. And how can you tell if something's oxidized one time versus two times? You can actually just count the number of oxygens. So here, I have one oxygen at the end, so it's one time. How many oxygens at the end? Two, so it's oxidized twice. And what if I have this? No reaction. Why no reaction? It's tertiary, no hidden hydrogen. So you see out this carbon here, how many bonds shown coming off of there? there to anything. How many? So you see I have one, two, three, four bonds. So are there any hidden hydrogens? No, so that's why you have the no reaction. So that's one uh, type of reaction, which would be your oxidation. We also looked at these. Like that. So figure out what you would put over the arrow there. So what do y'all think? I'm going from an alcohol to a bromine. Do y'all see that? HBr. And why HBr? It's tertiary. So if I summarize, a tertiary will either use HBr or HCl, depending on which halogen. And a primary secondary will use PBr3 or SOCl2. So let's look at this mechanism really quick. What is this here? An acid, because the hydrogen's listed first. Is OH a good leaving group? No. What is it like to leave as? Water. So my alcohol is going to grab a hydrogen so I can leave as water. Now, I know this isn't, or let's start right here. 
What type of alcohol is this? Tertiary. So do you think you're going to form a carbocation? Yes. All right. If you have a tertiary um, alcohol and you could form a carbocation, you probably will because that's the most stable carbocation. So water will just leave on its own. So what charge will it leave in its place? Positive. And what will make a bond there? The bromine. To give us our final product. And it's the same mechanism if you have HCl. The only difference is just chlorine instead of bromine. Okay, and then let's look at Sorry if I'm going fast. I just want to make sure I get everything in there. This will all be vodcasted so you can always slow me down when you re-listen to me. Well, you don't have to like actually slow my voice down, but you can pause it. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't sound like some demon or something. <laughs> okay, what would this turn the alcohol into? Chlorine, yeah. And let's look at the mechanism here. Do you remember what happens first here? Yeah, the, yeah, the oxygen here will make a bond to that sulfur, because it's kind of like a carbonyl. So what will happen to the double bond? It'll go up, come back down, because it has what to leave? Chlorine to leave. So now that I've made all those arrows, let's see what I just did. So chlorine left. Now, oxygen's bonded to sulfur. You see we made a bond right there. And then at the end, the oxygen, is that going to be a single bond or double bond? It goes up, come back down, so double bond. And then how many uh, bonds to chlorine? One. So it's going to look exactly the same, one less chlorine, because we kicked it off. Now that has a positive charge. So this is what, or come up here, what type of alcohol is that? Primary. Does a primary make a good carbocation? No. So will it form a carbocation? No, this is going to stay on there until it's attacked. Look at our final product. So what's going to make a bond there? Chlorine. So chlorine comes over here, makes a bond, causes this whole oxygen mess to leave. Okay, so that's another class of reactions. So we have the oxidation. We have, we'll call it the halogenation, meaning we're going to turn an alcohol, an alcohol into a halogen somewhere or another. And then the last type uh, that we focused on was esterification. So what functional group are we making? An ester. What does an ester look like? Carbonyl. Oh, yeah, O carbon. It's just like an ether, except it has a carbonyl. And that's why they kind of sound similar. Okay, so with that, you would have something kind of like this.
So overall, um, OH, that's going to be my leaving group, but what does it actually leave as? Water. And what's going to replace it? The OCH3. Okay, so since I have an acid listed here, that's the first thing that needs to react because it has a positive charge. So the carbonyl oxygen will actually grab that hydrogen there. That's probably the hardest part of the whole thing because you have to remember to do that. Now after that, it's probably exactly what you would predict. So what wants to make a bond to that carbonyl? The OCH3. Push the electrons up. What will, um, I'm going to reform my carbonyl, but what's going to leave? We said it over here. What was my leaving group? OH is water. Now, which hydrogen will it pull off? Not the one at the top. The one down here, because it has a positive charge over here, so that's why it's a little bit more reactive. So we pull these electrons back down, which kicks this off and grabs that hydrogen. What's our final step to get to our product? Yeah, take all the hydrogen, and we can just use our water that left there to grab the hydrogen off. And the other way we can make an ester, which is actually easier, is like this. And it's pretty much the same thing, except what is your leaving group in this case? Chlorine. And what will replace it? That O carbon group. So chlorine's gone. Then I can put O, one, two, three, three carbons. One, two, three. Also notice on here, did I put a acid in there? No. So you don't have to worry about that whole acid step. So at this point, if I just really quickly, basically that'll make a bond there. Electrons will go up, come back down. Chlorine kicks off across that hydrogen. And I just did it in one step. But if you can follow those arrows, that's what happens. So again, alcohol, where does it make a bond? Carbonyl carbon, which causes those electrons to go up. Now, what is my leaving group, we said? Chlorine. So chlorine will push those electrons down. And then as it leaves, you can go ahead and grab that hydrogen off so it's neutralized. And that is pretty much chapter 11. So focus on oxidation, halogenation, and esterification. Okay, so those are your sort of three classes of reactions. And then finally, chapter 14.
for this, for 14 focus mainly on ethers and epoxides, so let's name an ether. So our ether is always carbon O carbon, so an oxygen between two carbons. Which side is more complicated? I guess the left or the right? The other left. So how would I name how many carbons there to the left? Three, so that would be propane. And then my ether part is like a branch. And which carbon is it coming off of? Not three, but because one's closer than three. And what is that? What This is a how many carbon? One meth. And then how do we say with the oxygen? Methoxy. So if there were two carbons there, that would have been a ethoxy or propoxy or butoxy. So it's the prefix with oxy is how you name the branch. Is there hydrogen bonding with a halog uh, an ether? No, but can it accept a hydrogen bond? Yes. Since there's no hydrogen bonding, which one would have a higher boiling point, an ether or an alcohol? Alcohol because of the hydrogen bonding. Okay, so let's look at the two ways to make an ether. First is Williamson ether. So let's do this one backwards. We're going to make that using Williamson ether. So I need to know my starting material. So if we look at both sides of the oxygen, where will my halogen go? The top or the bottom? The top. And what's the deciding factor there? Primary. So if we look on this side of the oxygen, that carbon is what? Secondary. And we look on this side, it's primary. So I have one, two carbons there, one, two, and then put, let's say, bromine works, or chlorine or whatever. So what will my alcohol look like? <laughs> with an H. And without this, right? So a person with only lead. And how could I take that hydrogen off? Or what would take a hydrogen off? A base. So really any base. Uh, they use NaH a lot. Uh, you could even just use a hydroxide. Should work just fine. But anyway, just some base. Uh, we could also make an ether in this way. So what would this add on my double bond? Not OH, because that's if I have water right there. But is that water? No. So what am I adding? Just O carbon group. And does this one add Mikarnikov or anti? Marcus, so it'll go in the middle or at the end? The middle. 
that you see, let me put a box around it. That is my carbon group I'm adding. So O, one, two, three, three carbons. One, two, three. So it looks like that. Now the difference, that we've seen this reaction before when we have water there. Water added there would just put an OH. But an alcohol added there makes an ether. Uh, we can also look at the ether cleavage, which would be like breaking it up. So let's kind of break this down because sapling kind of breaks, it's not this exact one, but it breaks it down. Okay, so the first time it reacts, so overall it's going to react two times. You see that there's a two in front there, so it'll react two times. So the first time, what happens? Look at the, let's look at the mechanism. This alcohol is going to, or not, this oxygen is going to grab a hydrogen, bromine leaves. So something like that. What happens next? Bromine will do what? Attack one of the carbons and cause this to leave, right? So one of my products I just made is this, so where the bromine is, and then what just left? HO with two carbons. So on sapling homework, you have something similar to this. And the first step, it has two boxes. And that's what it's looking for. It's looking for your halogen carbon group and the alcohol. So this one can't react any further. But this one can. OH, what does it like to leave us? Water. You see I have two HBRs in there. So it's going to grab another hydrogen. And then what's my final step? Bromine attacks the carbon again, pushing the water off. So my squares there are what sapling's looking for. So again, the two squares at the beginning are your alcohol and your alkyl halide. And then your final square is your final alkyl halide. All right, then there's also, so that's everything for the ether. So now let's look at the epoxide. There's two ways to make this. First, it's MCPVA, and what does that put on there? Just the epoxide. Then let's do this one one step at a time, the next one. Okay, because one of the ones on sapling that they wanted to work out was similar to this. So, and step one at the bottom there, what does that put on the double bond? 
BR and OH. Now, where will the alcohol go? The Makarnikov position, the more stable position. So, which one, which carbon will go on? The, the yeah, the center carbon. So for, for step one, we have OH, BR. What is this right here? A base. What does a base do? Takes off a hydrogen, right? Which hydrogen is it going to take off? This this hydrogen right here, right? So when it's gone, where will it make a bond? The carbon attached to the bromine. Bromine leaves. And you end up with the same epoxide as you see above. So those are the two ways to make an epoxide. MCPVA or bromine, water, and a base. Now there's two reactions an epoxide can undergo, and these are the last two reactions of the chapter and the exam. So this one is this acid or base catalyzed? Acid catalyzed. So my nucleophile over the arrow will go to the most or least substituted. Which one? Most substituted, which will be which side? The, the center one right there. The one of the most branches. Then what does an epoxide open up as? OH. So my epoxide will now be OH. And then what am I adding right there? OCH3. If I was looking at this mechanism, what would happen first here? Yeah, the oxygen will grab the H because of the, it's reactive. And then what will attack this epoxide? The oxygen on the CH3. Which will open that up there. Uh, OH. CH3 hydrogen. And then what's my final step here? Yeah, well, I probably just use like another methanol here. Whatever. Just take off the hydrogen. If you want to, if you don't want to be specific, I don't even care if you just put B for base. Some base is going to take off that hydrogen. Give you your final bond or final product. Uh-huh. So then my last reaction Actually, let's do the one Let me just pull the saplings Because this one actually works
Okay. Do you see any acid listed in here? No, you would have like a hydrogen listed first or an H plus or something in there. There's no acid in here. So it's base catalyzed. So my nucleophile, will that go to the most or least substituted carbon? Least substituted. So is that the right or the left? The left. What does my epoxide always open up as? OH. So my nucleophile, ethanol and water, these are just uh, uh, the solvents there. Okay? So this C and the cyanide there, cyano group, is your nucleophile. Sodium, what does that do? Spectra your ion, so it's just hiding this negative charge. So where will I put my C in? The left. So it'll attach right there, which causes this to open up as alcohol. So that would be a base catalyzed. Now, I don't know if they make you do this. I haven't tried it. There's actually a triple bond. Do they make you do that? OK. So if you keep missing it and you don't know why, well, it could be for other reasons. But it could just be that you have to actually put a triple bond um, between the carbon and nitrogen. If you look, think of, so sodium is sort of a pseudo bond there. OK. And then I have a nitrogen. So it only looks like two bonds. So how many more do I need? Uh, two more, and that those go between the nitrogen, carbon nitrogen. So anytime you see carbon nitrogen, it's always a triple bond. So C triple bond N will go right here, and the epoxide opens up as alcohol. And then if you need to leave, you can leave. There's only one more they want me to go over. Is that one? That's the one. And it's this last one here. We could do this all together. Okay. So first of all, the hints really are um, the names here. So this one's 2-methyl-2-butene. So uh, when you see ene, what does that to have? A double bond. Do you see that this is the only one with a double bond? So that goes right there. And then here we have 3-bromo, uh, 3-methyl-2-butanol. Uh, so butanol is alcohol and it's on carbon two and then I have a methyl and a bromine on the same carbon. Do you see? Uh, three three. So that would be this one right here. So let's look at this to make sure you can see that. One, two, three, four. So this sort of like U kind of thing here is the butanol. So one, two, three, four. And I would put the alcohol in which carbon? Two. And then right here, this would be carbon 3. And what do I have off of there? A methyl and a bromine. OK? So now I have to figure out how to go from here to here. OK? Now, do you see?